Okay, well, six o'clock. Delighted to see so many people here to, uh, for a talk on a matter that uh, I hope you'll find to be of public interest, uh, animals and the law. And I, I say that early on in case anyone sitting here has actually showed up for the Law and Literature Moot, which is next door in room 105. Now would be the time to, I hope the room doesn't empty when I, when I say that. Um, that's me. Um, I, I need no introduction. I, actually, I do, but the dean who is going to give them is out of town, so uh, I'll just have to say that I teach here at the law school, and, and uh, I, I guess that'll, that'll do. I, I, I suppose I should say I teach, among other things, a course in animals and the law, and one of the exciting things and great things about teaching that course is the great variety of opinion and attitude and background that the students who register in that course take. I get students who are sort of strict vegans and won't eat honey because we steal it from the, the bees, and I get other students there who have clubbed seals and whose family clubbed seals and who think that just great and are there to, to make sure that point gets across. And as a teaching experience, that's wonderful. I like a group hug as much as the next person, but in, as a pedagogical experience, uh, a variety of opinion and very strongly held opinions is just a wonderful thing to have in the classroom. I've been very fortunate uh, in my teaching of the course so far that although people show up with some very diverse opinions about the subjects that we covered in that course, they've always been able to express those very respectfully, no matter how deeply held they are. And uh, I say that because my sense is there may be a comparable range of opinions on this subject held by people in this room. And I do want to find some time maybe in about 45 minutes or an hour where we can have some discussion. And I hope in that discussion I'll benefit from the continued good luck of respectful exchange of, of deeply held views. Um, I should probably start by trying to define a little more tightly the area of what I hope to speak about tonight. Because animals in the law, if we just phrase it that way, is a pretty big topic. And again, if, if I can illustrate that by reference to the sort of essays that the students have done in the course that I teach, because students are allowed to pick their own essay topics as, well, as long as it's got animals and the law in it. Um, I've had students do big historical essays, that is, essays on trials of animals in medieval France, on the history of the offense of bestiality as it's developed over the last 500 years, on an interesting Nova Scotia statute dealing with animals uh, here in Halifax back in 1823, so big historical uh, approach. I've had students who've gone pretty broad geographically, done uh, their essays and their research on the, the Japanese war on whales in the Southern Ocean, on bear farming in China, on conflicts between elephants and farmers in Sri Lanka. Um, so big scope. I won't be doing any of that tonight. I'm not going to do the his history at all, except perhaps there's some very quick allusions. I'm going to focus on the present. I'm not going to go international and attempt to say anything about the law anywhere other than Canada, except again very briefly for comparative purposes. So, so uh, we've nailed it to the, so far to the present and to, uh, and to this country. But even then, if I can go back to the sorts of things my students have thought it was worthwhile to research, they've been pretty broad in this country. They've included essays on conflicts between uh, grizzly bears and, and um, and sort of human habitation in BC, um, the, uh, the rather deficient animal laws in the Yukon Territory on problems with ducks landing in the tailing ponds for sim crude in Alberta, with, um, with uh, farming of pregnant mares in Alberta. Uh, in Ontario, people have focused on their recent legislation banning pit bulls, and then someone did one on New Brunswick, where they don't care a bit about pit bulls, but have a bill against Rottweilers. Go, go figure that out. Uh, I've had essays on uh, foie gras farming in Quebec, and so on. So large uh, scope of, of sort of geography within this country, and, um, and you know, just orientation towards, uh, towards uh, different types of concerns dealing with animals, including things like animals and intellectual property legislation. Can you patent the Harvard mouse and that sort of thing? So it's, it's pretty broad. Uh, again, I should try to narrow then what I hope principally to address today, which is to focus mainly on issues of animal suffering, of the, the mistreatment of animals and the way that the law 
uh, tries uh, to address that. So I, I'm not so concerned about um, animal issues that don't bear, or at least don't bear primarily on uh, the suffering of animals. Um, so it narrows, narrows that, I think, to a certain concern. I should say, ultimately, though, I am interested principally in the law, not the moral approach to this issue. I'm, I'm interested in the law and more generally what constitutes justice towards animals in Canada today. Uh, I might also say a word about you know, which animals, the, the topic again of the, of the lecture is animals and the law, and there's lots of animals from the single-celled well ones on up. Uh, which ones are we concerned with? When I teach my course in animals and the law, the first reading that I give to the students deals with cruelty to lobsters, partly because I want to make sure to the students registered in the course that it's not just a course about cats and dogs and horses, that we want to think sort of more broadly about uh, what animals are covered. It's very interesting. You, you could do a whole talk, I think, on definitions of animals in the law. If I looked at some of the statutes that are out there, for instance, Nova Scotia's new uh, Animal Cruelty Protection Act has got a definition of animals, and it says animals are every non-human vertebrate. It's very important, apparently, to the Nova Scotia legislature to have a backbone, and if you don't, they don't care about you, so that, for instance, there cannot be a prosecution for uh, cruelty to lobsters in Nova Scotia because it's thought important to have uh, a backbone, at least under that statute. And there are other statutes that use that definition. There are statutes that use definitions of any animal is a non-human that can feel pain, um, which is interesting because there's, uh, I think, considerable empirical doubt about whether certain animals feel pain or not, so it's a rather vague definition. I, and as I say, I think we could talk a lot about statutory definition, just do the whole talk on you know, why does this statute define animals one way and another statute define it another. Generally, I don't want to narrow things too much. I'm not, I don't really care much about cockroaches. Um, so I won't talk a lot about them, although if people want to get back to cockroach issues in the question period, that's fine. Broadly speaking, more generally, the law has been concerned mainly with mammals, to a certain extent with birds. I, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the uh, criminal code uh, provision for cruelty to animals, and it doesn't have a definition. Uh, so in theory, under the criminal code of animals, uh, criminal code of Canada, there could be a prosecution for cruelty to any animal. In fact, when you look at what's brought, there's never been one brought with respect to amphibians or fish. Uh, there's actually one, one reptile case, um, but it's sort of a weird one um, that doesn't really, doesn't really count. The law is mainly concerned with mammals uh, and sometimes with birds, uh, particularly chickens, in the context of, of, uh, of agriculture. So um, as I say, I'm not too concerned to narrow my concern here, apart from the fact that I'm not much concerned with insects, and neither has, neither has the, the law been, but, uh, but things are open on that score. Um, so where to start? Well, I'm a real Canadian, so I, I think you just have to start with uh, the Constitution, namely, are animals a federal or a provincial concern? Uh, that's, that's where you start with uh, law anywhere in Canada with the Constitution. Who's got the authority to deal with animals? Well, an interesting feature about our Constitution, it doesn't have the word animal in it, neither in the original 1867 one that, that sets up the structure of the country and, and divides uh, legislative authority. It doesn't mention the word animals at all. Neither does the Charter of Rights in 1982. That doesn't make Canada particularly special, but there are constitutions of countries around the world that do. Germany mentions animals in its constitution uh, as of amendment of about uh, nine years ago. Switzerland did the same. There, there are countries that think that in their fundamental law that sets up the country and talks about what the polity is all about, that there might be room there for mentioning animals too, that it's that fundamental. The German uh, the German uh, provision, just very briefly, is this, that the German constitution has for a long period had a provision that says the government shall treat humans with dignity. Pretty vague, doesn't say a lot. In the year 2001, 
they added a phrase. Uh, my German's not much to that. Um, und I hear, and the animals, the government shall treat humans and animals with dignity, is in their constitution. Now, I don't know that that changes much. They still farm and eat and experiment on animals, but I, I guess they're required to do so in a way that preserves animals' dignity. Um, it's not quite clear how that cashes out, uh, and I think it hasn't made a big change yet, but it, I think it's a nice thing that it's in the, the Constitution. Ours has nothing, as I say, about animals, but it does indirectly. Uh, if you go back to our Constitution of 1867, it uh, says things about who's got authority over fisheries. The Constitution talks about who's got authority over agriculture. It talks more importantly about who's got authority over property. So it deals with animals indirectly, and in a way, uh, somewhat disturbingly, the animals in our Constitution are already commodities. There's nothing in our Constitution that says anything about fish. There's something that says something about the fisheries, that in, in our fundamental law that sets up the Canadian polity, animals are there, but they're pre-commoditized, commodified uh, as falling under agriculture, falling under fishery, or, and I, I think this is the most central provision, property. Um, they fall under property because that's the way the common law has always treated animals. It's done so in the, in the law of England for centuries, and there's no definition, no sort of deviation from that. So the provinces have got constitutional authority over property that is in the province, and that means um, animals. Animals are property, or at least they have the capacity to become property. There are some animals out there that aren't yet owned by anyone, but if you catch them or, or kill them and bring them home, they become property. So the, the animals that aren't property at least are capable of being made property by appropriate action. So that there are provisions in the Constitution, I mean, there pretty much have to be, that, that give the, the, either the federal or the provincial government authority to deal indirectly with animals because animals fall under classification. And, and I don't want to go into that in great detail. It's split. Uh, for instance, with agriculture, both the feds and the provinces have got authority over agriculture. It's a split jurisdiction. Fisheries is mostly feds on the offshore, but the provinces can do some inland fisheries. Uh, there's there's a, a range of ways in which animals can fall un, un, under either federal or provincial um, provincial legislation under a constitution, and, and I may get back to some details on that, but I, I think the, the big picture, I can leave it there for the moment. I wanted as well to speak in that connection with where animals fit more in the political structure, or do they fit at all in the political structure? I know this is a talk about the law, but the, you know, I was telling our students that the, the borderline between law and politics is a shifting and vague one, so we get to talk about politics here too. And in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about the question of sort of who speaks for animals uh, in the governments, either federally or provincially. Um, there isn't anyone up there in Ottawa that has, I think, the, the mission, or even as a major part of their mission, the right to speak or think or represent animals at the federal cabinet table. There's a minister of the environment at that table, but they're not principally focused on animals. I, I was actually at a talk from the, uh, a while back from um, someone from the Federal Department of Agriculture who specifically said animal suffering and animal care is not part of our mission. Right? They, they, they have a lot to do with animals at the Federal Department of Agriculture, but to the extent anyone is concerned with bad treatment or suffering of animals, it's not the Department of Agriculture. They're concerned with farming and agriculture and, and the health of that, so to, to the extent you think that it might come under uh, agriculture, there would be something. Ultimately, I think the only people, at least in Ottawa, who, who speak much for animals is the Federal Department of Justice. Um, and they've also got a lot of other things to concern with, but they're the ones who consider the revision to the animal cruelty provisions in the criminal code. Um, and uh, it's, it, at the one level, I quite like that. I think it's important to think about how we treat animals as a fundamental issue of justice. And um, it, I think that's an important federal ministry. And to the extent they can 
They are the only place, pretty well, to go if we've got concerns about animal treatment. It's nice that it's under justice. On the other hand, if you actually try to find any individual lawyer up there who's got sort of the animal's portfolio, um, I haven't been able to find them yet. It's, it's something that they get concerned with only um, interstitially and, and, um, and, um, and not very often. Um, I want to move now to what I think is the central way in which the law speaks to animal suffering in Canada, and that's the provisions, the criminal or quasi-criminal provisions that permit persons who inflict suffering on animals to be prosecuted if they commit a crime. And, and the, prince, the main one there is found in the Criminal Code of Canada, and I want to spend a little bit of time on it. There's a provision in the Criminal Code of Canada. It was enacted fairly early in our uh, in, uh, in the country's history. We were founded in 1867. There were the, it was added to the Criminal Law of Canada about three years later. We copied uh, very largely a provision that had come into the Criminal Law of England in the 1820s, and it's been part of our criminal law ever since. As I say, we, we, it's, it's traced to an English law that's, that's less than 200 years old. So as a first observation, there's not a long history of caring about animal suffering in uh, Anglo-Canadian law. It really dates to the 1820s, and we can talk a little bit more about the history of that uh, in question period if anyone is interested. But it, it came into Canadian criminal law very shortly after the founding of the country. It hasn't been much changed for a long time. The, the provision that we find in the criminal code, and I'll, I'll try to deal with it in a little detail in a second, hasn't much changed since Queen Victoria's day. There's been a little bit of tweaking. It's been broadened somewhat. When it first came in, uh, like the English one, it's, it focused just on cattle and horses. Then it got broadened to include dogs. And now it's just all animals. So it, it originally focused rather narrowly. And now it's, it's open to all species. But apart from that, the general structure of the law hasn't much changed, and, and here it is. Uh, I think I should read out to you the, the main core that you'll find in, in section 446 of our criminal code. It says, persons shall not willfully cause unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury to an animal. You can't cause unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury to an animal. That's a concept that's found in our criminal code. It's also found in all the provincial animal cruelty legislation, because the, as I said, things are split so that the, there's an animal cruelty provision in the Criminal Code of Canada, but all the provinces, including Nova Scotia, have a specific statute that the feds get to do it because it's criminal, the provinces get to do it because animals are property, so they can both legislate on this. And, and you know, obviously, you can't get charged and convicted with violating both the criminal code or the, and a provincial one. The, the, there's, there's part of criminal law that they have to choose. But there's a, there's a remarkable overlap. And, the provision in the, in the provincial statutes is pretty much the same as the federal one. The core idea is you can't cause unnecessary pain or suffering to an animal. And I should go on to say, beyond it's that concept just being found in the criminal code, it's found in a lot of other statutes as well. There's a specific federal statute dealing with transportation of farmed animals from the farm to the slaughterhouse. And basically it says, You've got to transport them in a way that doesn't cause unnecessary pain and suffering. There's another federal statute that deals with how animals have to be treated when they're at the slaughterhouse, how they're kept and how they are killed. And it says, you shall not do that in a way that causes unnecessary pain and suffering. The, the concept of causing unnecessary pain and suffering is one that you see again and again in not only in our most general statute, the criminal code applies to everything, right? Applies to farmers applies to people who experiment on animals, applies to people who hunt, people who own pets. It's general. And we've got a, a whole heap of specific statutes dealing with hunters and, and, and uh, farmers and a range of things. But they all basically adopt the same core concept. You shall not cause unnecessary pain and suffering. Note, in this, in this formulation, at least one of the things that, that jumps out to me, it's not a harm to an animal to bring about its death in a way that doesn't involve pain and suffering. So if you inflict on an animal a quick and painless death, just sneak up behind it and, and kill it in an instantaneous fashion, that's not a violation of the criminal code. That is, it, it doesn't seem that the, the sort of the life 
of animals is of value in the criminal law. We, we're just concerned about their suffering. Um, now, of course, if you, if you shoot, if, you, if the animal would just sneak up behind and shoot is your neighbor's dog, you're in trouble, but you're in trouble basically for the same reason uh, that you would be in trouble if you wrecked your neighbor's car. It's your neighbor's property. You can't harm people's property. Um, and the, the criminal code deals with that just simply by saying you, know, you can't wreck somebody else's property. That's what, that's what uh, sort of covers painful death. But notion, um, sorry, that's what covers uh, death to, to animals that you don't own. But it's not a harm to kill your own animal, right? Um, I, I think it's, people may not realize it, but those of you who have pets, you're entitled to go home and kill them in a way that doesn't cause pain and suffering for the same reason you can go home and smash up a chair that you don't like anymore. It's yours, um, you're, you're entitled, just as part of owning property, you're entitled to destroy the property that you own. Now we interfere in that, we regulate property in a lot of ways, so we regulate what you can do to the cats you own by saying you can kill them, but you can't do it in a way that causes unnecessary pain and suffering. Um, so you, can, you, you can't go home and torture your cat uh, to death, but you can, you can kill it in a painless fashion. And it's always interesting to me that you know, the, the, the sort of death of animals, the curtailment of their life in, in the the way that we so routinely do it in agriculture is not thought to be a harm to them. You know, I think of the harms that could occur to me. You know, a, a death, even if it was quick and painless, would be a pretty great one. Um, and interestingly, I think it would also hurt members of my family. There's one here today, and I hope she'll later agree that you know, it would be a harm to, uh, harm to her if I was killed, no matter how painlessly. That doesn't count for animals, that is, if they see their parents killed, I mean, I, I think we're starting to realize that animals do have emotional bonds and that one animal might suffer if uh, its friend or sibling or whatever were killed. That doesn't anywhere figure in to the law. So the key then is you can't cause them unnecessary suffering. I, I want to spend a few minutes on that concept. It's a pretty open one and potentially you might think it provides a lot of protection for animals because Gee, why is it necessary to cause them any suffering at all? I mean, no, no doubt out there in the wild there's lots of suffering, but why do humans have to cause that? And if the law says um, we're not allowed to cause suffering to animals unless it's uh, necessary, that might seem to give them a whole lot of protection. And in theory it might, but when you turn to what the courts have done and have done consistently on that, I, I think, we'll see, I, I think you'll agree with me, it, it's not a whole bunch of protection. And I just I think we have to talk about a few court cases, decisions from Canadian courts that, that illustrate this. I, I, I mean, a, a very simple one, a, a case was brought against a, a rodeo because the rodeo in, and I gather this is sort of standard practice in, in rodeos, to get a horse to buck, they put a sort of a cinch, like a big belt across its genitals that is pulled very tight just before the horse is released to cause the horse pain so it bucks more than otherwise would be done. And it's an intentional infliction of pain. Now, how much it hurts? Some people, oh, it's just uncomfortable. Um, or some other people, it hurts a heck of a lot. Um, I'll leave that to your imagination. But, uh, but the prosecution that was brought with respect to that failed because the rodeo was able to say, that's necessary pain, because if you don't do that, they don't buck. If you don't, if they don't buck, People aren't going to come to the rodeo. Rodeos are good, clean family fun. It's a legitimate thing to do to, you know, to run a rodeo and compete with other sources of entertainment out there. So that the intentional infliction of that pain or even discomfort is necessary to running a rodeo. Um, I, let me just give you um, another example. Uh, a prosecution was brought against a a slaughterhouse for killing pigs in a way that is, you know, I won't go into detail, but it seems like a whole lot of pain. They sort of shackled them by a chain on the hind, one hind leg and swung the chain so that the pig's head hit the concrete wall and it seemed sort of, uh, seemed relatively painful. And that was, uh, a, a prosecution was brought there for causing unnecessary pain and suffering. And, and again, it failed because the slaughterhouse is, is able to make this argument. One, 
It's legitimate to eat meat. People like to do it. You, you don't have to. They don't have to prove that it's necessary to eat meat. Simply, people like doing it. It's a legitimate uh, industry. You have to, as a slaughterhouse, operate in an efficient fashion. You know, pork is in competition with tofu and a whole bunch of things. If we took the time to kill them in a, a less painful fashion, it would be more expensive and we wouldn't be able to compete. And therefore, we're just, you know, the, the main argument is we're not doing it for sadistic purposes. We're doing it to make money. And basically, I think the argument works this way. If you're causing injury to animals to make money as opposed to, you know, you just get your jollies out of it, then it's necessary pain and suffering. And I, I, I think I've got to inflict a third example on you, because it, it's, it's a, a recent case, and it, uh, to my mind, illustrates a lot. In, in the raising of chickens for meat, chickens have been sort of bred in a, in a way that they, uh, the, the, the ones that are raised for meat, as opposed to those that lay eggs, grow very, very quickly, uh, much more quickly than they would in the wild. They get to sort of slaughter weight in 39 or 40 weeks. They, they just, they're bred to be really, really fat. Um, and, and just to put on a, a lot of weight. And, um, and so that's fine. But then there's the problem of, um, of the chickens that are used to breed the, uh, the so-called broiler chickens. Who's going to lay the eggs for these chickens? Well, the problem is they get so fat in 39 weeks, that, that's when you take them off to market, but they don't become sexually mature by that age. They don't become sexually mature until whatever, 60 weeks. So, You've got to have the same phenotype of chicken get to 60 weeks before it can start laying eggs so that you can keep producing them. Well, there's a problem. Because the chickens were bred in such a way that they put on so much weight, if you actually let them eat food, they don't get to be 60 weeks old because their legs break before they get, or they have heart attacks, right? They, they just can't, um, can't survive, or at least a lot of them get broken legs or wings problems. So that the only way you can get them old enough to lay the eggs for the broiler chickens is to keep them perpetually hungry so that the breeders for broiler chickens never get a square meal their whole life. They have to be sort of underfed always because if you let them eat as much as they want, um, they get fat and their legs break. So a prosecution is brought, again, under the same notion. That's causing unnecessary suffering. You're not feeding them ever a regular diet. Again, the prosecution fails because the argument is that's, you know, chicken is sure you could breed them so they didn't get fat so quick, but then we wouldn't be able to take them to market at 39 weeks. We'd have to wait till 80 weeks. That, you know, that's, that's just not economically efficient. We'd, we'd lose out to the tofu manufacturers or, or whatever. We've, we're just in it to make a profit. We're not doing it because we hate chicken, so it's necessary pain and suffering. Um, so that it's always sort of interesting to me that the, the definition or the contents that the courts give to that phrase is, is one that I think some people find surprising. And, and you might wonder then, well, where does it ever result in a conviction? Well, if, if you get a couple of frat boys who just like torturing a cat to death, um, they can be prosecuted for causing unnecessary pain and suffering. And you might then wonder, well, why can't they come to court and say, well, this is the only way I can get my jollies, and nothing else makes me as happy as sadistically torturing a cat, so why, you know, if, why doesn't that argument work for me if the profit argument works? Well, the courts just say it's, sadism is not a legitimate goal. Profit-making is, you know, competing in the food and supplying, supplying people with various products that they want are legitimate goals, but sadistic torturing of animals is not. Um, so that's the, the main structure of the law. And that's why, to date, th there hasn't been, although people think that we've got provisions against animal cruelty in the criminal code, it, it doesn't interfere with the normal way in which agriculture or entertainment or anything is, is carried on, as long as people are, are sort of not, uh, as long as people are sort of pursuing a, a sort of profitable goal. There's a, a sort of an interesting adjunct to that. It's sort of been a bad news story so far, but, but uh, there's one case that did succeed in illustrate in sort of making a claim for suffering. It, it's not a Canadian one, it's an English one, but uh, I think it would go the same in Canada. And some people 
may know about this one. Uh, there's a, a bunch of protesters in London and England who were picketing outside McDonald's, handling out leaflets, saying McDonald's is responsible for a lot of animal suffering in that they, they've got a lot of control over their suppliers, the people they buy the, the chickens and beef from, and they, they don't uh, require their suppliers to adhere to any particular standards, and, and they, they sort of feed into the whole agricultural production system. And so the people who are leafleting McDonald's think McDonald's causes cruelty. And McDonald's, in, in what has got to be, the, at least in retrospect, the stupidest move they ever made, sued those people for defamation, took them to court for saying, we don't do that. And surprisingly, they, they did, the defendants there didn't do what I think I would do and everybody in the room would do, which is cave in and say, sorry, sorry, forget about it, I won't do it again. They, they actually went to court and defended Defended on this ground, it's true that McDonald's causes cruelty to animals. And you would think, well, how are they going to succeed on that, given the definition and, and the way the courts have treated uh, the concept of unnecessary suffering so far? Well, they won for this reason. Under the law of defamation, the law says that we should take words in their ordinary person in the street meaning not this definition of what's unnecessary cruelty under the criminal code, but what would the person in the street say? So the people actually took years and years to call the experts and say, here's what it's like on the chicken farms McDonald's buys from. Here's what it's like on the beef farms McDonald's buys from. What do you think? What do you, the court, think as to whether that's cruelty or not? And the court said, yeah, it is. And McDonald's lost. They lost on the defense of truth because, and to, to my mind, this is the core lesson from this case, if you actually take the, what the law of defamation says we have to take, meaning words in their ordinary everyday meaning, what the people walking around the street think amounts to cruelty, there is cruelty in the food reproduction system, but not in the way that the courts give it uh, under the criminal law. So um, that, as I say, is the sort of the main provision, uh, the main sort of uh, legal provision that's brought to bear on animal suffering. Um, I'll just say a, a couple of, of things about how it's really brought to bear. I mentioned it's pretty much only brought to bear on mammals, as I say, the frat boys who, who torture cats, so it's not, it's not brought to bear on the animal industry, um, not brought to bear on, on uh, treatment of fish or anything else. Um, there's a curious provision uh, or a sort of way that um, the criminal code is applied for the animal cruelty provisions. Unlike anything else in the criminal code, investigation and prosecution is handed over to the societies for prevention of cruelty to animals. It's, we don't do that for other provisions. We've got the police who are charged with, the, you know, the, they've got investigation. We've got sort of crown prosecutors who are dealing with that. For animals, we've got basically hire a charity to do the enforcement for us. And there's a, there's a long history around that. Um, but it's, it results in a curious sort of skewing of the prosecution because how does the SPCA get its money? It gets it very largely from charitable donations. Um, and it has to keep its name in the news. And it's actually sometimes very effective you know, when, they, when they do bring a prosecution. They're, they're actually pretty good on the public relations front, better than the police are, about getting their, uh, their prosecutions in the newspaper. They're very good at it because unlike the police, they know it, their funding depends on it, that they hope that you know, all of you, when you die, will leave something to the SBCA in their will so they can carry on the good work. It does, among other things, mean that they have to skew their investigations and enforcement to areas where they think the public will be sympathy. They're basically a dog and pony show and cats, too. They, there's not much in it for the SPCA to be worried about cruelty to chickens because it doesn't rack up that well on the donations front. Um, so it, it's, an, it's an odd sort of skew. It's got advantages. Um, but it's got some disadvantages too, and again, I might want to come back to that. Now, there are, I, I focused a lot on the provision for unnecessary cruelty. There are lots of other quite specific provisions in the law dealing with animals. That is, I, I mentioned there's a, a federal statute 
dealing with transportation of animals from the farm to the slaughterhouse, and it says that when you're transporting them, you shall not cause unnecessary cruelty. And we talked about that. It also lays out lots of very nuts and bolts things about stocking density, about the angle that the ramps have, about uh, how often you have to stop to water the horses, um, um, how much ventilation there has to be. There's a whole range of very specific provisions, and I think no point and, and certainly no time to go into all of those there. I will make this uh, sort of unsupported observation about them. Canada is, is not a world leader on those. If you compare the Canadian provisions, just say on transport to animals, with those in force in at least the European countries, you know, how often the animals have to get a drink of water on the way from the farm to the slaughterhouse, we're, we're not very good. Uh, and there's room for improvement. A particular difficulty Canada has um, is that we're very tied into the United States. Um, and it's very difficult for Canada to change its laws, particularly in the agriculture field, if the United States doesn't. Um, and here I want to sort of move to what I think is one of the most important, uh, at least important to animal welfare, legal disputes that's coming down the pipe here. And that's the Canadian challenge to the European seal ban, uh, or ban on importation of of seal meat. The, the European Union uh, started off with bans in the, the Netherlands and, and Belgium and Luxembourg, but now it's, it's EU broad, has put a ban on importation of Canadian seal products. And they've been quite specific that it's on animal welfare basis. They, you know, some people have complained about, you know, was the seal hunt uh, likely to uh, threaten the population of seals? Um, and differing opinions on that. I defer to anybody in the room on that one, but the Europeans didn't rest it on that, on their, their ban that's, that's uh, recently come into effect. They said, it's, you know, seals are sentient creatures and you can't kill them in a way that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's acceptable. And they, they based it on animal welfare standards. Canada is challenging that under the World Trade Organization, saying you can't do that. You know, we've got free trade, the WTO system allows some sort of barriers, for instance, if when Canada had a BSE outbreak, the mad cow disease, the United States and some other countries said, we're not importing Canadian beef until you get that cleared up. You can, you can have bans if animal products going across borders threaten human life or threaten other animal life. It's not clear whether you can have one on grounds of animal welfare. It's, you know, we can, if anybody wants to go into the details of the exceptions in Article 20 of the of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. It's, it's, it's a very much open question. Who's going to win that one? And it will be very interesting to watch. Why I think it's so important um, for animals is, is this. What if, say, in the agricultural sphere, Canada wanted to treat animals a little bit better than the United States does? I mean, here's a, a, a specific regulation. I, I said before, Canada's got, quite apart from the cruelty uh, provisions. There's lots of specific um, um, provisions dealing with animals. And, and one of them deals with how much space you have to give a chicken that's, that's being raised for uh, uh, and laying eggs. The, the EU is actually phasing out cages for chickens. Just my point earlier about Europe being ahead of us. They haven't done so yet, but it's, it's coming into effect. You, chickens got to be able to walk around on the ground. But that's more expensive. Right? Um, you can't jam as many of them into a room. The law in Canada is that you've got to give a uh, chicken 60 square inches. Not, you know, smaller than this, this piece of paper. It's not very much. What if we wanted to up it in, in Canada and say, you've got to give a chicken 72 square inches to move around in? We could do that. But that would be a problem for Canadian chicken farmers because in the United States, it's 60 square inches. And if you have to give a chicken more space, you can't jam as many of them in the same size building. It's more expensive. And chicken, at least chicken, frozen chicken products and everything, go across international borders, as do other animal products. So could Canada say this? This is what I think is an issue in the... In the Seals case. Could Canada say, 
Here in Canada, you've got to give a chicken 60 square inches. And moreover, if chicken products are coming into Canada, either live chickens or frozen ones or whatever, they have to be raised under those same conditions. So that American farmers, if they wanted to sell their frozen chicken products into Canada, would have to agree that they, they got their 72 square inches. And it would apply to you know, eggs that came from those chickens and eggs that were in cookies. I mean, it would be pretty, pretty broad provision. Could we say that? Um, I don't know. That's what's at stake in the seal case. And to my mind, it's, I really hope Canada loses that one because as a broad, not just Canada and the chicken example, the, the World Trade Organization rules are, whether we realize it or not, crucially important because if you can't, if, in imposing your welfare standards, if you can't impose them in terms of trade bans elsewhere, then you basically can't bring them in. Canada can't effectively tell its farmers that it's got to give 72 square inches to a chicken because if the, they can't stop the U.S. bringing in products from 60 square inches, they'll just undercut them. And you, know, you can't do that to Canadian farmers, so, you know, ethically and, and certainly not politically. So I think the, the seal um, dispute that will go to the WTO panel, and certainly to the WTO appeal panel, it won't be done anytime soon, is, is to my mind uh, a crucial one because, and, and you've, you've seen this phenomenon elsewhere, because of the way that um, we've been, in some sense given up our sovereignty to be a part of the World Trade Organization um, uh, system. So um, a big case to watch there. Um, I want to say Couple more things, but but uh, you know the time's coming when when you'll have your say um, in about ten minutes, I think. Um, I think broadly speaking, I'd say the situation for animals in Canada is not improving. hasn't improved in in my lifetime. The criminal code hasn't changed. The standards, for the most part, haven't changed. I think, in, in fact, it's it may surprise people. It's actually getting worse for animals. Worse partly because agriculture on its own is getting worse. There's just more animals being raised uh, in more industrialized conditions with legislation that hasn't responded to that. Um, there's a bunch of other provisions. I'm going to tell you about one that's very technical. Um, Canada brought into force, it's been in force just 10 years now, something called the Agriculture and Agri-Foods Administrative Monetary Penalties Act. And I know your eyes are glazing over just at the head of the statute. It doesn't bring into force any new provisions for animals. What the Agriculture and Agri-Foods Administrative Monetary Penalties Act did is to say provisions in federal legislation dealing with animal welfare, apart from the criminal code, but the ones dealing in agriculture, the ones that, that say regulate transportation of animals from the farm to the abattoir, um, should be dealt with no longer in the criminal courts, but by way of handing out tickets. Uh, tickets that do not result in uh, a criminal record, that don't result in you know, basically parking tickets. Or, or like, it's like getting a speeding ticket if you show up with. Uh, and, and the kinds of penalties, uh, just, I, mean, I was reading a case the other day because I'm looking at transportation of animals. Someone shows up at a slaughterhouse with, I think it was 3,000 dead chickens. They froze to death because they didn't insulate the truck, they had to pay the ticket, but it's $2,000, right? It's like it's 67 cents for every bird that froze to death. So basically, we've, we've taken things out of the criminal courts. The, the thinking behind that is that the, cross, the, the CFIA inspectors, the, the people from the Canada Food Inspection Agency, will, if they don't have to go to court and just sort of issue tickets, um, will issue them more readily. Um, they won't... If you have to go to court, you might think, oh, let's, let's forget it. That's, that's too expensive. I'll let you off with a warning. But the thinking is, let's, let's make the whole thing not so much a matter of the criminal law with its big stigma and its prosecutions and its criminal record and its possibilities of, of actual incarceration, not that we ever actually do lock up people for animal cruelty, but let's downgrade the penalties to basically fines uh, so that we will, uh, the theory is, the theory is, get much better compliance um, if, we, um, if we make it sort of less of a big deal to, to, to act that way so that the chickens 
die. Now, as I say, does, does that make for things getting better or not? I think it's, it's, it's hard to tell. It might work, and maybe it's sort of an empirical question there. Let me speak about the areas where I think change has occurred. I think it's important to identify the areas in which, for lack of a better word, progress has been made. One is with respect to um, species at risk. If, if animals are threatened with extinction, there are new Canadian laws, species at risk legislation and uh, Canadian laws dealing with uh, the trade in internationally endangered species that um, are quite promising. So if, if, if an animal is, is you know, sort of hunted and threatened to extinction, so there's only a couple thousand left in the world, we do start to take action, not really on the basis of the welfare of individual animals, but on the basis of threatened species. And there is some, at least, improvement there. Now, people who look at the legislation say it's, it's actually very hard to get the government to put the species on the, the list, but they do put some on. And so if you're, a, apart from individual animals, if you're a threatened species, there's been some progress. There has been some specific progress that has been due to international pressure. I'm thinking here of uh, considerable limitations on leg hold traps in trapping, interestingly brought about by pressure from European countries who said, you know, we think we're not going to buy your stuff if you use the leg hold trap. Uh, the, the other uh, provision that I mentioned almost in the same breath here is the the uh, law that came into effect uh, well, more than 20 years ago now, banning hunting of white coat seals, again, because of the European pressure um, that they thought it was particularly cruel that the, you know, the, the very cute little white baby seals were clubbed to death. I mean, we still hunt baby seals, but not the, not the white coats. And it's, so my point in mentioning this is if, if you want to sort of look at the areas, apart from the species legislation, the areas where Canadian law has actually changed with respect to welfare of individual animals. The, the ones that you can point to, interestingly, are as a result of international pressure, and for the most part, international trade pressure, not shaming, but actually, you know, we're not going to buy your products unless you stop using um, leg hold traps. Um, apart from that, um, it's rather discouraging. There was an attempt to update the criminal code provision, the one that I was talking about earlier that hasn't significantly changed since Queen Victoria's day. There were numerous bills that went to Parliament starting in the 90s and the year 2000. They were roundly opposed by the Conservative and Reform Party and by the agricultural uh, lobby and the animal experimentation lobby and came to nothing. The, the, we haven't been able to alter the criminal code provisions in Canada at all. And if you actually take the time to read the, the House of Commons debates on that and the, the committee debates on that, they're, they're thoroughly depressing in that they say that the, the whole move to update the criminal code was by well-funded you know, terrorist international animal rights people with a hidden agenda for, uh, you know, and the word terrorist does, was used in one of the debates, which it wasn't, right? It was, it was brought forth by the Canadian Humane Society. But there's, there's just been an absolute uh, dead-ended, even I think quite modestly updating the criminal code, with one important exception that I think I should mention, and, and the Harper government did do this. They did increase the penalties um, for as just part of the tough on crime agenda. You can get fined and go to jail for a bit longer than you used to be able to do, but the, the statute remains the same, the one that I was describing when I was talking about the the rodeo case and the, the pig slaughter case and so on. It, the only people that get convicted under it, for the most part, are, are sort of sadists and, and everything. And we don't mind putting them in jail. But it, it, didn't, it didn't alter the criminal code provisions in a way that, um, that made it broader or, or, or permitted any change. Um, a couple of, you know, it's getting depressing. I, I point to a, a couple of other sort of avenues for hope, if you want, if not yet change. One is in the United States. Um, through a method of legal change we don't have available to us in Canada, a lot of American states have, as part of their elections, the possibility for citizen initiatives to put things on ballots. 
um, and vote to actually amend the state constitution. At the same time, they're electing their governors and so on. The, the biggest animal change or sort of pro-animal uh, legal changes that have happened in the United States have come about through that method. Most recently, California's Proposition 2 in its, its most recent election, a couple, you know, the one that, that happened the same night uh, Obama got elected, was outlawing um, veal crates for chickens and, and uh, sorry, veal crates for, for cows and, and battery cages for chickens. It won't come into effect for a bunch of years, but when people actually get to vote, as opposed to, you know, the party members who are, you know, uh, re responsive to, um, you know, donations from the agricultural lobby and so on, and people actually get to exercise some choice, they actually vote for better animal welfare laws than the politicians give us. Um, and it, it's not just California, Florida did the same, Arizona did the same, they're not necessarily jurisdictions you think of as particularly progressive. Problematically, maybe it's a good thing, we don't have those sort of citizens' initiatives. They're not part of the Canadian uh, polity, so we don't have that route to us. The, the closest analogy I can think of in Canada is um, things that cities can do. Cities can be sort of, uh, the, the civic politics movement can, I think, be, um, you know, because it's not so tied into parties and it doesn't cost so much money to run for, for uh, city council as it does to run for parliament. Cities can do weird things, and you will get sort of, sort of pro-animal cities trying to bring in laws, only in effect in their city, that seem, you know, for lack of a better word, progressive. Windsor was one for a while. Windsor did a couple of interesting things. The city of Windsor um, changed all its civic bylaws to take out the word owner of animal and replace it with guardian didn't actually change anything, but instead of sort of owners of dogs have to buy a license, it's guardians of dogs have to. Now, it doesn't mean they're not owners. They can, you know, cities can't affect that. They can, you know, you can still buy and sell dogs and still kill them. But they, they changed the vocabulary, which is a nice move. They tried to go further in the city of Windsor and, and outlaw um, basically animal acts at circuses in Windsor. So that if you showed up in the circus, you couldn't have the the trained elephants and the lions leaping through the, the hoops and so on. They thought that was cruel and, and that struck me as good, but was found unconstitutional. Cities simply don't, cities have got power to deal with animals and as you know, city in Halifax can say that you can't raise chickens here, but uh, cities' power to deal with animals only really relates to nuisance, right? I, I can't start a pig farm in my house in the south end because it annoys my neighbors, but the, no cities in Canada have the power to deal with animal welfare. It's, the, the courts won't let them under their interpretation of the Municipal Act. So that, that well, civic politics can, I think, like, simply because cities can be sort of weird and, and uh, sort of not controlled by regular political forces, uh, have at least potentially the power to be um, uh, sort of progressive, if you want, um, uh, but it's, it's somewhat limited constitutionally. The, the final area that I want to talk about, and then I, I am going to shut up, is, is an area of, of um, some promise, that is consumers exercising by their pocketbook their power not to buy um, uh, products that they think, animal products or products that they think uh, uh, are produced by uh, methods that involve animal cruelty. And you think of you know, the, the body shop that says you know, everything in it is, is cruelty free and so on. I, th I think there's actually um, some hope for that um, and it may make a difference. I, we can make differences as individuals. If, if I get back to my sort of view as lawyer, what the law does about this, the government in Canada has been very slow about enacting any sort of legislation which would assist us in doing that. In, in fact, they've, they've effectively said we're not going to do that. So to the extent we want to, the, the government does this, you know, when you go out and buy a, a stove or a fridge, there's a sort of enter guide thing. So if you think you want to buy one that doesn't use a lot of electricity, there's a government system that can say this stove is efficient, this one's not. It gives you some information you can rely on. Wouldn't it be nice if the government provided a system that said, this is how much animal cruelty went into such and such a product. Um, 
because there's a lot more, um, you know, I, you know, it's going to be seen to be straying a bit far, but the, there's some laminated wood in this podium that I'm talking on. There's a fair chance that in the glue that holds the thing together, there's animal blood, right? The, the, we're, we're, and, the, and the chairs you're sitting on and the table. There's, there's a lot of animal products out there that are all around us. It's very far not to be, very difficult not to be involved in that. Um, wouldn't it be nice if when you were buying this, it, the government compelled you to disclose what was in it, the way it compels uh, food products to disclose, you know, here's how much sodium and here's this and so on. If, if you could convince the government to put in force a mandatory labeling system that gave us information as consumers to uh, make decisions that maybe influence producers, I think we'd have a really powerful tool. The difficulty that I see there is that the government hasn't responded to that. They, they've, they've taken some steps in this area. There's a, a very effective new piece of legislation from the Department of Agriculture, or sorry, regulation, that says there's a specific meaning to the word organic. You can't advertise something as organic without such and such uh, meaning, and we will enforce that um, so that people can tell whether something's organic or not. They've pretty much refused to do anything along the same lines with respect to animal cruelty, and it's, it's very difficult through the, the sort of optional labeling systems that we have out there to do something. I appreciate that there are f sort of private groups that, uh, that say, here are our standards, and you can buy our label, and it's, you can trust this label, it's cruelty free. I think for the most part, we don't trust those. They're not, they're, they're too, um, too ill-organized, not well inspected, not well enforced. So for the most part, I'm often reluctant to pay extra for a cruelty free product because I can't be guaranteed that it is. Um, so, you know, that basically when I teach the course, and I've tried to squeeze it all into about an hour here, I, I say, here's why the criminal law doesn't work, here's why consumer labeling doesn't work, here's why the constitute, nothing works, but, but maybe uh, some of you have got some suggestions that do. So I said I'd go for an hour, and that's about right. I, I hope you'll have some, either some questions or comments. But, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Gee, um, there's a bunch of, I mean, I could just go down the, the list of improvements that were before the House of Commons and voted down. One was to change the word willfully to, to say willfully or carelessly, um, because it's, it's very difficult to prove in court that somebody willfully caused cruelty. It's, it's one thing to say there was cruelty. Did someone actually intend to cause the cruelty has been a way in which a lot of prosecutions have failed. So if you said willfully or recklessly or carelessly caused suffering, I think you'd have, um, you'd have a, a better standard there. I, but I think more generally, um, I'm not sure you have to change the criminal code. You have to change the meaning that courts give to what is necessary suffering. Uh, because I think potentially the, the provision that you've got in the criminal code <coughs> is capable of very different interpretations than we've given it so far. And I'm not suggesting that the interpretations that the courts have given are totally out of whack with the understanding that most of us would have. So I, I did like to talk about the libel case that says, well, hold on, maybe people in the street do have a different understanding of unnecessary cruelty. But it, it's just a matter of maybe changing social attitudes so that courts can give a meaning to unnecessary cruelty that's a whole lot different than the one we've given it for the, the last 150 years.
No, my bigger thing is why doesn't the government, you know, hire the Department of Justice and the police and put them on the case to do? Yeah, you, you keep doing that. So. There's an interesting question I, I'd like to ask you, if I can. There's a, a significant change in the, Nova, the Provincial Animal Cruelty Act that Nova Scotia uh, and all the parties supported this uh, a couple of years ago is to take from the SPCA the role of investigation and prosecution for farm animals and give it to the Department of Agriculture. Um, and of course the upside is they, they know more about it. They're, they're the people who've got, that is the, the Department of Agriculture inspectors know more about farmed animals. And on the other hand, or not on the other hand, in addition, they're on the farms. They go to the farms, not just on the cruelty investigation, but they're there for the health inspection so that they're, they're more likely to be on people's farms, making sure they're in compliance with uh, provisions not to let, you know, hoof and mouth disease spread and that sort of stuff. On the other hand, pretty obviously, saying the Department of Agriculture should be the ones that brings cruelty charges against the farmers seems, I don't know, Fox Guard and the Hen House comes to mind, doesn't it? Huh? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but they all take orders from the minister. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been interesting because, of course, we've been now managing that portfolio for a year, and I think those yeah. their eyes have been open to yeah. some interesting things. And I don't know that they are as well trained as we might imagine. Um, we've actually shared training with them yeah. over the last year to help them better understand the portfolio and to bring them up to the same level of enforcement that we've been providing. Yeah. I just feel compelled to respond to your characterization of the rodeo case. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> rural Canadian, grow, grew up uh, around horses all my life, and I yeah. just want to uh, uh, object to the statement that uh, there's bucking, sitch, and moves around the genitalia of a horse. Yeah. Uh, it's placed around their flanks, which optically it looks like it's the case, but I would assert that's not the case. It yeah. does cause discomfort, but it's more of a training tool, like a dog collar or what have you. Yeah. It indicates to the horse that it's time to. Right. That wasn't the evidence in that case. I mean, you can go upstairs and read the, yeah, the no, case. I, I, I'm yeah. just offering yeah. another perspective. But maybe so things have changed. I just wanted to make sure that it was stated. I've, sure. I've been yeah. in that discussions in yeah. parts of the country yeah. all the time. So yeah. I just felt personally compelled. Yeah. Yeah. Good question on the angle of Yeah. But that's not what I wanted to comment on. I think your, your point about the well-taken, your comment, when I'm in the human Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to sort of follow the comment on every question, but I, I, I certainly agree with your opening statement. Of, among the sort of the, again, sort of progressive movements that you associate with the 60s and 70s, starting with the civil rights around race, the women's movement, um, but also generally the consumer movement, environment, and then later moving to, uh, to sexual orientation and so on. And that's when the animal rights thing got started too, 1975, particularly with Peter Singer's book, it's the conspicuous failure among those in it. You know, we've, we've got the charter and it addressed gender and race and, and uh, all these other things. We've got, we didn't used to have a Minister of the Environment, we've got one okay. now, an Environmental Protection Act. Animals have just fallen flat. And, and maybe that's, again, just going back to the social movement, it hasn't attracted quite the breadth 
of interest, it's been you know, convinced fewer people of its claims, and maybe that's just a simple explanation for why it hasn't cashed out with legal change, that there have been you know, human rights acts and <laughs> consumer protection acts um, and all these things, I'm probably not right in lumping them together, but, but you know, considerable sort of progressive bits of legal change since the 70s from those organizations, but animals nothing. Right? So, and, and I didn't go on down the long list, but a, a lot of, there's hunter protection legislation that gives greater protection to hunters than we had before. There's, there's the listing of animal rights groups as a, as a terrorist priority for CSIS. There's, 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 you know, sort of a backlash. You know, before backlash before you actually make any gains. It's, yeah. Um, you said at the beginning of your lecture that there's no specific political entity or member, at least at the federal government, yeah. who speaks for animals. Yeah. And I was thinking about in Ontario how they they, they have these child advocates yeah. who they've appointed to represent children because they don't really have a voice. I was wondering if any jurisdiction, provincially, federally, or even internationally, has appointed like an animal advocate. There's it's someone. Switzerland did Zurich. Zurich? Yeah. Canton of Zurich. There you have one. I, I heard, and I haven't been able to follow up on this, that in British Columbia there was one Crown prosecutor who was designated with that as a special, in the same way that we designated Crown prosecutors as specialists in, in, uh, in rape cases or something like that. Let's, let's get people who know the law and they'll only take those. So let's assign a Crown prosecutor just on the animals. Case. Now, it wasn't 100% of that, but that all the animals' cases would be directed to one Crown prosecutor, so you would build up some expertise, um, which sounded progressive, uh, or at least a move that you've seen elsewhere. Uh, yeah? You know, I'm, I'm curious, I'm, you know, you, you talk about the EU as being more progressive than they yeah. are, and Greece and Canada and the US being much more slow. Yeah. Great diversity among the European nations, but yeah. look, that part of the world, as opposed to yeah. Canadians and US, that we're not as individuals responding to yeah. progressive, which I, you know, anyway, yeah. That's I was a, so fixated yeah. on the, the talk of that. Yeah. I wish, I wish I knew. I don't know if anybody else in the room. It, 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 it might be as part of whatever the explanation is for why Europe is ahead of us on greenhouse gases. Or whatever. Over in Europe, they don't seem to, I mean, if we stick with the greenhouse gases or whatever, the environmental, the government doesn't seem to regard the environmental movement as the enemy. They don't always win, but they seem to get to sit around the same table as industry, and the government, you know, doesn't think you're trying to overthrow the country just because you're trying to. You know. um, and over here, I don't see that same attitude. The government seems very sort of against the environmental movement and against the animal movement. But why that is, I don't, I mean, it's not that animals aren't property in Europe like they are here. Everybody likes to point to the, you know, it's, it's all because animals are property. Well, I mean, that's a big part of it, but animals are property in Germany too. It's, but if you had to be a farmed animal in Germany or Canada, you'd, you'd choose Germany in terms of getting to walk around. And, <laughs> I mean, before you get killed. But. So I don't know, so why, why are they, what is it about Europe that's... Uh, yeah, yeah. More radical, I think. I mean, yeah. uh, <coughs> they're better at making bombs and things like this. If you look at the, the history yeah. of the animal liberation movement in Britain, in places like Britain, yeah. particularly Britain. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask another question, which is, you know, you've been going to about the bit, things being un under-regulated, but in yeah. actual fact, is there an area where it's over-regulated? And you can probably see where I'm going, which is animal okay. use in universities, which this right. is one of them. Yeah. It's not true that there isn't a, a, an Ottawa thing on this. There's a CCAC, Canadian yeah. Council for Animal Care, yeah. and their control over animal use in universities has got more and more stringent to yeah. about whatever adjective you want to use. Yeah. Uh, so um, some scientists in the university who allegedly are you know, about to improve human health, maybe, yeah. uh, are finding it more difficult to work on animals because of the larger regulation area, so in yeah. fact, it's gone the other way, yeah. would be my view. That's a good question, and I, 
I didn't talk about the regulation of experimentation on animals in Canada. Interestingly, I just came from, I sit on Dalhousie's University Committee and Laboratory, and I just came from a four-hour meeting. We meet the third Thursday of every month to review the protocol, so I know a little bit about what you're talking about, and certainly from the point of view of the scientists who are trying to do good things, there's a whole lot of paperwork you have to do, and, and uh, you know, whether from the point of view of the animals, that's, that's uh, any, any great benefit, but certainly the sort of the bureaucracy, the time it takes as a researcher to have to justify what you're doing has increased. Well, um, two yeah. points of view, right? Yeah. Just, as I, just as the point of view of the humans who want to eat meat, yeah. the point of view of the animals who don't want to be shot. Yeah. The other thing you didn't talk about, basically, which is related to this, is lobbying. Yeah. And you talked about the Humane Society doing this or that, and, yeah. and as if it was a positive thing. But in fact, Peter has been responsible for taking over uh, some of the Humane Societies, I think the Toronto one, one, yeah. point, one in Maine, extracting money from them, and sort of radicalizing them, so they've got a different yeah. point of view. Yeah. And so the idea that this legislation is being pushed by progressive forces depends on how you define Peter, you define yeah. it as a progressive force yeah. or as a terrorist, quasi terrorist organization like Sinn Fein versus the IRA. Yeah. So. Good point. I want to say one more thing about animal experimentation, just to, to um, do a, a follow up. Uh, your talk about over regulation uh, may be fair in the context of organizations that are covered by the CCAC, like the universities and the hospitals are. Private labs don't have to belong to the CCAC. They are not covered by that. They are covered only by the Criminal Code of Canada, which I told you about before. Anybody want to guess how many, which would apply to the universities as well. Anybody want to guess how many prosecutions have been brought in Canada against uh, experimenters on animals? The CCAC is self-regulated. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but the Criminal Code applies as well. Yeah, zero, right? Um, right? Because, you know, who's, who's going into the labs? And probably there isn't that much of you. Probably whatever suffering, and sometimes it might be awful, is, is justified, at least under the law. But talk about overregulation. Who's, who's in there checking? And it's not on the, it's the beat in, of any cop. It's uh, happened in Britain. And yeah. One old guy who's abusing his yeah. cats or something. Yeah. On, on the point about the sort of the radicalization of humane societies, that it is interesting. They, they can vary remarkably, um, and that might be another source for change in that you can have some humane societies, you know, they're often broke up provincially uh, in Ontario, so that you get one humane society in one town with one attitude and another mm -hmm. in the next, and some of them just seem to like to catch a lot of dogs so they can sell them to the labs and get a lot of money and take vacations in Florida. They, they're not really very pro-animal at all. And you get some others that are very influenced by the sorts of agendas that you just said. And there have been some very interesting sort of power struggles within humane societies between the, the, the sort of the group that's trying to take it over to do some radical lobbying and so on. A, 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 a point about the lobbying, and then I'll leave this one go, humane societies are not entitled to do much polit political work or SBCAs because they, they lose their charitable, I can see my tax colleague here is nodding, you, you, you lose your charitable status if you do that because then you become political. So you can save one cat at a time, but if you devote half your budget into lobbying the federal government to change the laws, you lose your charitable status. Um, so they're sort of constrained from acting systemically. Right. Yeah. The Agriculture and Agri-Food Administrative Penalty Act, yeah. is that tied to the WTO? No, nothing to do with that. Uh, it, it's not a statute that enacted any new standards. It simply said for all the standards that are out there in a, in a long list of statutes, um, you can proceed by this informal, quick, not criminal, not criminal penalty, issue a ticket route. And it, it didn't actually erase the criminal. You, you can still do prosecutions, but they don't anymore. The notion is that prosecu prosecution is, I'm straying off camera, prosecution is and compliance is better achieved by 
um, not stigmatizing things through the criminal process. Just b basically make it a tax. To so where is the leadership then? In your estimation, in your estimation, is it, is it in the people in the street? Is that where the leadership, that leadership is? Gee, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that one at all. Yeah. Um, does the law care about non-human animals because they're valuable intrinsically or because of what they mean to us? Well, I think both. I mean, potentially the criminal code, if you look at it, it looks like it's a bad thing to cause suffering to animals, and that would seem to be because of what they are intrinsically. It, it's got some other provisions that obviously deal with what they mean to us. Let me give you an example. It's a, and this just goes back to the fact that it hasn't been changed for a long time. It's a greater offense to injure your neighbor's cattle than to injure your neighbor's dog. Now, why is that? Is it the cattle suffer more than the dog? Well, I don't think so. They're likely to be more expensive, or they were in Queen Victoria's day, where they were sort of crucial to uh, you know, they were the, the big <coughs> chattel that anybody would own, and dogs were cheap. There, there's no explanation for why it attracts a bigger penalty to injure your neighbor's cow than to injure your neighbor's cat. And it's only explicable, it's, they only matter because of what they mean to people, but that's not the only provision out there. So it's a mix. Well, I would quickly add, though, the cattle, isn't it obviously that the cattle is part of the reproductive system? Yeah. I don't know. No. Yeah. So. Well, it's just like cities, I'm a practical one, seems to care more about dogs that are running loose than the dog pound. We don't have a cat pound. Yeah. Because dogs have this different status. Dogs are workers. They're, yeah. They work for the blind or they yeah. for our dogs. But what do cats do? They're yeah. both companion animals. But it seems like cities cherish a dog more than a cat. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's over 200,000 feral cats in yeah. Africa. Yeah, there's more statutes dealing with dogs than almost all other animals, but the Dog Liability Acts, and especially the dogs of, you know, the, the animal that's been domesticated the longest, and you could, I could talk the whole hour on dog law. There's, there's lots of dog statutes out there doing a whole bunch of weird, you know, special provision on dogs that chase sheep. And, uh, yeah. Uh, straight That's an interesting question. One area, there's obviously a lot of tension but that is generated by this notion of treating animals as property because many of us regard them as more like family members. They're not quite the same as our human family members, but, but closer to that than our tables and chairs. And there's been a number of interesting court decisions in recent years dealing with how much money you give a human in compensation for their typically dog or cat who's been killed, not necessarily intentionally, but just run over by a careless driver or sometimes killed by you know, your neighbor's Rottweiler. And the traditional rule was you just got market value. And you know, given you can get a dog from the pound for free, you, you didn't get very much. Uh, you know, if you had a very expensive show dog, that was something. But uh, you know, especially you know, someone has a 10-year-old mixed breed dog, how much can you sell that for? Well, not much, and that's basically what you God, in recent years, the courts have been recognizing the emotional attachment that we feel to companion animals in particular and edging things up a bit. Uh, not massively, so you get uh, large amounts, but uh, a couple thousand dollars for things, like, which sometimes comes into, sometimes it suits against negligent veterinarians who, who, um, who uh, you know, accidentally kill a dog or something. So the, the, some slight progress to saying that they're, you know, unlike other chattels, it's, it's not just market value. And in fact, in the United States, not in Canada, there's actually been some um, 
legislation on that. Tennessee's got a statute called the Tebow Act, passed by or advocated by a Tennessee senator whose dog named Tebow got killed and he didn't get much money for it. So he passed a law saying you can, the courts can order, and I forget what, $2,000 uh, for emotional stress for a, for a dog. Didn't apply to farm dogs for some reason. I don't know, just suburban dogs. Because, you know, presumably farmers don't care about their dogs. I don't know. That's the, that's the story. So, that, so it's, it's not just courts. It's been some legislatures, and there may well be other states who have done the same thing by way of saying, hey, the traditional market value approach to an intentionally or carelessly killed companion animal doesn't reflect reality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you started the lecture by talking about how in your first class you would talk about lobsters, which is sort of my soapbox issue that yeah. I like to talk about. Do you know of any jurisdictions that would include invertebrates or like fish and crustaceans and all that in sort of their animal cruelty stuff? Well, again, the Criminal Code of Canada doesn't have a definition, so in theory you could bring it under there, but no prosecutor ever has. It's always been mammals and Birds, I mentioned one case of a reptile, but it was one of these animal hoarders who, you know, they'd be fine in their house, and they've got 54 cats and six dogs, but they had a turtle, too, that they weren't taking care of that either, and so there was prosecution for all of them, including the turtle, so, uh, but apart from that one case, nobody cares or has cared about it, um, and it would be an interesting question as to whether a court would say a lobster is an animal for the purpose of the criminal. I mean, we all know biologically they are, but I don't, I'm not sure what a court would say about that. Um, so no, there's pretty much nothing going on. For, for okay. uh, I'm curious what the difference is between activities like dog fighting and uh, rodeo, because yeah. those seem to be entertainment based on the suffering of an animal. Like, yeah. Well, I, I just think it's, my sense is just very informed by broad social mores. That most people think rodeos are family fun and they would take their kids to them. And I mean, obviously, there's, there's much more to it than that. The, the animals in dogfighting are much more routinely badly hurt than the animals in, in rodeos are. So I wouldn't, wouldn't want to underplay that. But I think it's, you know, we do have an absolute bar against dogfighting. I didn't get into all the provisions in the criminal code, but you. you there's a specific provision, no dog fighting, can't, you can't uh, provision, but uh, actually we could change our views as to rodeos and then the, the courts might change too. Is this sort of yeah. an issue of degree right now? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think a friend in the back row could go a long way between the difference between rodeos and, and dog fights, but, but some people say, geez, it's really the same. They're a lot more similar than the, the traditional view. Gambling. What's that? One involves gambling. Yeah. Well, also gambling is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The, yeah. I would argue yeah. that yeah. the, you know, what, what separates the two dog fighting and rodeos or the bullfight, you know, from the circus of humans um, is that, you know, we're defining pain as physical. And one can make the argument, I think, too, that in, in any form of animal entertainment, some of the pain and suffering causes psychological emotions. Science has proved, and it would be guidelines today to say that animals do not feel or think. Yeah. The physiologist Mark Baikoff, for instance, who wrote an analysis, definitely argued that animals have cognitions, they have feelings. So, you know, I would like to see moves in that way that you know, we ban dog fighting because they experience physical pain, they tear each other apart, but yeah. I'd like to see rodents ban, bull fighting ban because of a conscious psychological pain. Yeah. Well, I, I thought of one comment to your question about where is the leadership. I didn't have an answer, but for I see a few students in their audience, and there is a student group at the law school that's concerned about animal welfare. And, and uh, if, if you're a student at the law school and you don't know about that, come up to me afterwards, and I can put you in touch with them. You're, you're not alone. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the agriculture law. Yeah. State by state? Yeah. Because you called it the Canadian agriculture lobby. Yeah. Really, the food supply is determined, or food is determined by the provincial, it's designated provincially by the health department. So I'm wondering if calling it the Canadian agriculture lobby isn't giving it an authority that really doesn't exist. Could we not? 
could be done. Could yeah. we not vote provincially? Right. I, my recollection of where I used the phrase agricultural lobby was in the, the defeating of the updating an amendment to the criminal code, and I, you know, specifically speaking about the Canadian Cattlemen's Association shows up before the parliamentary committee and says, okay. you know, don't do this, it'll put us out of business. So I that's, that's what I'm thinking. But the Americans are voting state on a state basis, but we vote, we, that's a federal criminal code. Um, well, no, the provinces could do things under their provincial legislation, so it's both. Um, okay. Yeah? yeah, there was a question. Well, there may be people in the room who know more about this than I do. The, 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 if they own the dogs, they are entitled, under the current interpretation of the criminal code's cruelty provision, to kill them. They can't do it in an unnecessarily cruel fashion. So if they um, shot one dog while the other was watching and caused this panic that was unnecessary, as opposed to taking them out and you know, doing it one by one so that nobody knew what was happening until it was over, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. But I, I, I'm going to use this as a, a, a platform to get back to what I said about the criminal code provision. There's no reason a court couldn't say in a situation like that, we reinterpret it, that you have, before you can do that, you have to make a reasonable effort to see whether somebody would want to give those dogs a happy home. And that it's unnecessary even to cause them their, a relatively painless death without exploring that option, assuming it could be explored relatively cheaply. But I, I don't actually see anything in the criminal code that would prevent a court from saying, you, you know, before you can kill a perfectly healthy animal that someone might love, you know, post something on the internet and ask if anybody wants them and tell them that they've got a month to get them or, or whatever. Um, that doesn't seem impossible, but it has nothing like that has happened yet. See, the, the common, I, I, I've tried for my course to dig back to see if you could find one case back in, you know, 1222 where they first decided that. And you, you can't find, it's just always been, property, not just in the common law, but in Roman law and, you know, everything that's even roughly analogous to us. I mean, I don't know about indigenous law systems, whether they might have some hope for anything. I think it would be a, a massively radical change. And, and, and part of what I would want to know is, change it from property to what? Because um, um, I'm not sure anybody's given me the, the best alternative. It, seem, it seems like a, a laudable but difficult to grasp goal. Uh, I think you have to sort of imagine what it would be like, and it's important to think imaginatively about that and try to think about what that world would be like. But it's, how you get from here to there is, is not something I know. Yeah, I think maybe what I'm going to do, because it, we said till 7.30, is take one more and then give people who want to run a chance to sort of exit en masse, and then if other people want to continue, that's fine. But I think we'll do one more question, and then I'll say goodnight and if everybody wants to go, but we can leave a small but select group. But yes, sir. Yeah. Regarding your last point, this is not the direction the German law intends to go. Well, <laughs> Well, it puts dignity which, on. Yeah. Which, may, which may enable future legislation yeah. to um, shift the, uh, the focus from criminal law to, uh, human, uh, yeah. to human rights law. Yeah. Right. Maybe. It that's could work. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly, you know, back to Windsor, that's what they're trying to get at with this word guardian. It doesn't actually change the law, but it's like, it's like introducing the word Ms. You know, if we start talking differently, we will think that we don't have to designate women's uh, marital status by calling them Miss or Mrs. And, and things change. So let's call them guardians. I sometimes wonder if guardian is the best 
model because it, you know, I'm a guardian of my children. I'm not sure I want to infantilize animals that <coughs> have to me be their papa because they've got a lot over me in a lot of respects. So somehow the guardian model that we associate with, you know, mentally incompetent persons and infants doesn't seem quite the label for animals either. That's why I think I have to think about what, what other word or relationship we'd have. So listen, um, as I said, if people want to stay, I'm, I'm very happy to do so, but it, Sticker did say you could all get released by uh, 7.30, so I'll, I'll thank you for that, and uh, thank you.